Good afternoon um, to everyone who's just joining us. Um, thank you for joining us. We have just over five minutes before we'll get started. Um, but so just hold on um, and we'll make a start um, at the hour. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's event. Um, we'll be starting in about four minutes. Um, we're just seeing the numbers gradually um, go up. Uh, so please bear with us and we'll begin um, on the hour.
thank you for joining us for today's event um where we're going to see the numbers of participants are still going up um i expect we'll start in one or two minutes um, so just bear with us thank you Thanks again for everyone who's joining us today um, at the event. Um, we will, I can still see the, the number of participants going upwards. Um, so we'll give it another perhaps 30 seconds to a minute before we get started. Okay, it's, um, it's just past the hour, so I think we'll make a start today. Um, thank you very much um, for uh, joining us today on what is the, um, the, the, the latest um, in the series of um, collaborations in webinars between uh, CBSE and the ARM School Programme, really centered around the topics of physical computing and project-based learning. Uh, today's session, is around uh, plate projects, looking at the transition from typically young learners um, as they move from primary school to secondary school, um, from play to project-based learning. Um, before we get started, I would like to, to thank um, CBSE, to thank Dr. Saha and Mr. R.P. Singh, and to welcome Mr. R.P. Singh to uh, today's event. Um, it's been a, a, a real pleasure to present the sessions up till now. And we're now in the middle of the series um, and we have three more to go over the coming months. Uh, as part of this presentation, we'll just do a summary uh, shortly of our, um, our sessions so far. And I'll explain where you can access those uh, recordings later. Okay, let's um, move on. So, um, Starting with this, uh, this welcome and introduction, um, I will give a little bit of background on the ARM School Program. Uh, we've done this in previous sessions, but I think it's worth uh, giving some context to teachers who may not have uh, joined previous sessions. We'll then go on to the main pro uh, professional development session, which is going to be run by my colleague, Rob Lehman. I'll then hand over to um, Surya, uh, my colleague, to talk about feedback on the session. We always really welcome uh, teachers thoughts and feedback on what worked and what they would like to see in future sessions which we then um, we then take on board uh, for uh, future presentations we'll then do a Q&A of about 15 to 20 minutes and uh, finish the session I expect that the full session will last in the region of an hour and a half in total 
Okay, so before we get started, I'd just like to, to mention a couple of housekeeping points. Um, firstly, if you have any questions throughout the session, uh, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, and my colleague Surya will um, endeavour to answer them as we go along. If there are any questions that come up through the uh, professional development session, um, then we will gather those up and answer them in the Q&A at the end. So yeah, we'd really welcome any thoughts, any questions that you have um, about the, uh, the topics we're presenting on today. Um, and also to mention on certification. So a, a common question that comes up um, in, in all of the sessions is where, where do we get the certificates from uh, for attending the session? Certificates will be emailed out to you um, after the session, along with a link to the recording of the event. Uh, so that's that's where you get your certificates. Okay. So just a, a brief introduction to your speakers. Uh, my name's Nick Sample. I manage the Arm School program. Uh, my background is really in um, education and educational publishing. So I've worked um, across a number of different countries, principally in um, STEM um, publishing for schools from across the UK, uh, the Middle East and the US before then uh, about four or five years ago, joining ARM to set up the ARM school program. And uh, the main session will be run by my colleague, Rob. Rob is a, um, is a computer science teacher so he has he has worked in teaching for about 10 years before then moving into um into curriculum development so he worked with exam boards over in the uk setting the um setting the specifications for exams in the uk and internationally so you're, you're very much in good hands when it comes to the professional development session okay so let me tell you a little bit about the school program. Um, as you, you may know, ARM is a, um, is, is the, the, the sort of basis for ARM is really around semiconductor design. So uh, we create essentially the blueprints for the uh, microprocessors that you will find in, in lots of devices, lots of connected devices from uh, laptops to mobile phones to even, even household devices like fridges. Uh, but ARM doesn't actually manufacture anything. Um, we we create the, the, the blueprints, the plans in a sense, which we then license out to organizations that then uh, manufacture the, uh, the, the chips. So as part of our, our um, role really at the, the start of a, an ecosystem of um, technology organizations, we feel it's really important that we take a stake in schools education um, and really work with the, that network of organizations that we work with to um, help support uh, teaching of um, STEM education in the classroom globally. So our vision as a program is to empower all learners with the opportunity to develop the interests, knowledge and skills that enable a lifetime of engagement in STEM. And that's whether the learner goes on to, to, to work within the technology industry, work within science, um, or, or simply as, a, as an informed citizen who can make choices the right choices for them around things like use of data this sort of thing so the school program um, as i mentioned was set up four or five years ago and uh, our our way of working really is to um, support teachers in the classroom um, so we work with teaching organizations um, communities of practice uh, to support um, the evolving sense of what is best practice within um, STEM and computing. Um, our real sort of uh, center of gravity really is in computer science. But as we'll look at in the professional development session, a lot of the ideas that are presented within um, a very practical approach to the use of computing in the classroom really do um, apply to multiple uh, subject areas. Uh, most not notably the, the STEM subjects, um, but also going into to topics like literacy. Um, so, you know, there's a re it's a very, very rich ground to explore. Um, to support teachers in doing this, uh, we have uh, a professional development uh, program on edX, which is free to access. All of our uh, content is free to access. 
Um, so you can find that on edX.org if you search for project-based learning. We also have um, on our website um, a range of free to access materials that you can you can download. And I've put a link there to our site. And here it is. So this is what it looks like. Um, and at the top of the page, um, I'd really point you towards this. There is a link to a brochure um, which you can download and it really does walk you through end to end the, um, the ARM School program, our approach and, um, and the, the support that we offer teachers. And this is what that brochure looks like. So I would very much recommend um, downloading that and taking a look if you're curious about the, um, what else we can do for, uh, for you as teachers. And you can also on our site, you can, you'll find a, um, a, a, a box at the bottom of the page where you can enter your email address and subscribe to our newsletter, which comes once a term. So once every few months, and it just gives you a, a summary of the updates from our program. And the uh, professional development program um, that I mentioned uh, a minute ago um, on, on edX.org is broken into three courses, as you can see here. And the, um, uh, as I mentioned, it is free to access. And the, the webinar series that this uh, session forms part of really draws upon the themes that are covered across those three, th three and four courses. So if you're curious at all about exploring any of the topics that are uh, raised throughout the webinar series, we'd really encourage you to um, sign up to the uh, edX program and, and try, try out one of the courses. Um, uh, it's, it's free to access. Each one takes in the region of 10 to 12 hours to complete if you include the classroom practice as part of it. If you just go through the material, it's probably a few hours, um, but it does take a deeper dive into the topics that we're discussing. Now this session, um, which is highlighted here, is, is pretty much in the middle of the C series that we're running with um, in partnership with CBSC. If you would um, like to access previous uh, sessions, you'll find links to those on the community site uh, where you are registered for this event. So that's uh, on the ARM community site. Future events. So the next one coming up is uh, we've got in February and then March and April. Next one is on assessing projects in physical computing. So one of the um, the issues that a lot of teachers have with physical computing and uh, project based learning is how to effectively assess it. So it can feel like it feels like a very very different uh, way of managing a classroom, a very different way of facilitating learning compared to more, a more didactic approach. So assessment is something that, that is, is, is often um, a, uh, a concern for teachers before they embark on, on, on trying uh, project-based learning out. We're going to present on that and, and just, just walk through some uh, methodologies that you can use to assess your students' progress um, in the carrying out their project-based learning activities. We'll then go on to look at um, the affordances of project-based learning of physical computing for developing employability skills. Um, and these are the sort of skills that um, empl employees would use in companies like ARM, um, whether they're engineers, whether they work in, in more on the corporate side of the business. Um, skills like uh, resilience, um, attributes like resilience, skills like um, teamwork, uh, communication, this sort of thing. So that's going to be the, the, the next session. And then we finish with how to run an innovation day. An innovation day is a, is a fantastic uh, way of engaging your students with, um, with uh, technology. Uh, it can be run um, from in about five hours with either a class or a school or multiple schools as we've done uh, previously on, on the school program we've had uh, teams from up to 25 to 30 schools come together to compete uh, on uh, uh, an innovation day uh, competing to build a solution to a uh, problem connected to the global goals so um, this is something that we'll we'll talk you through if you want to run your own innovation day it's it's, it's relatively straightforward there are a few tips that are useful to know um, and we'll close the 
webinar series by covering that and hopefully that, that's something that you can take away and run with your school in the near future. Okay, so we now enter the um, the main training session. So I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague, Rob Lehman. The training will last um, about an hour um, and then we'll come back to, uh, I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Surya, to talk about feedback and then we'll move into Q&A. Okay, thanks, over to Rob. Hello and welcome to the latest OnScore program session in collaboration with CBSE all around from play to projects. In today's session, we're going to be looking at uh, some simpler versions of project-based learning and how that reflects in the practice of play-based learning, which is very, very similar to project-based learning, but just differentiated and scaffolded slightly different for younger learners. We're going to look at how to understand the ASP schema and how to apply that in a simpler setting for younger learners and understand the differences between project-based learning and play-based learning. We're going to be looking at several different examples of uh, projects which we can apply through physical computing and play-based learning and understand how to support learners in getting the most out of these when teaching computing. We're also going to be looking at some of the physical and hardware considerations around these sorts of projects and how to simplify these things to make their delivery uh, with younger learners more effective. And we're also going to be looking at uh, the types of context that we can use for the types of projects and how to actively engage learners. So we'll start off with a really nice quote which is from Piaget, which really sums up um, why we use project-based learning and play-based learning. And it's, uh, it's, it just really, really captures the sort of the nuance of why we do this and you know, what is the goal of education? And is it just about um, structuring the learning around rote teaching and learning or is it more about trying to develop creative and innovative minds and I think this really kind of underpins everything that the Armscore program resources and um, approach um, tries to push towards it's this trying to teach learners how to think and apply technology creatively to make new discoveries and to learn more effectively. So what is play-based learning? We've looked at in previous sessions what project-based learning is and dived into the nuts and bolts of what makes up project-based learning and how the Arm School program uh, defines what that uh, pedagogical approach is. Um, now, play-based learning is very, very similar. It just it's slightly simpler and it's uh, nuanced and um, simplified so that it's much more easily applicable by young uh, by teachers for younger learners. And that has a uh, dual approach in. So insofar as that younger learners obviously less experienced with technology and computing and all of the subjects that we're trying to instill upon them. And also generally teachers are less specialist around the sorts of technologies that we seek to apply. But, you know, what is play based learning in its simplest form? So, you know, play is a defining feature of human development. We all play as children. This is how we learn uh, and play is inherently engaging, you know, just children will naturally play and you see this throughout uh, humans and also animals that pl plays how we learn to cope and deal with the real world and this inherent engagement of play can be harnessed by educators to enhance learning and to make it more effective it's essentially adding scaffolding or a structure around play to focus the play to be more um, useful in what we're trying to get them to do or to learn or to uh, learn about a particular subject or a particular context. So it's a, it's a really, really useful way of uh, getting the natural engagement of play and harnessing it and applying it to, to teaching a particular subject or context. And, and we'll see various examples of that as we go through today's session. In the classical sense of play-based learning, it's child initiated and teacher supported. So you would, um, or certainly in the literature, children are let loose and sort of learn by doing, and then the teacher will support them by asking questions uh, with a slightly um, sort of Socratic approach about, you know, why are you doing this? Have you thought about doing X? What is the consequence of doing Y? Um, almost, and you can think of it almost a bit like uh, some of the elements of the prim approach um, as applied in computing, where uh, you're not directed, directively um, structuring the, the, the session with the learner, they are still playing, but you're just sort of poking them in, in the right sort of direction by posing interesting questions and trying to lead in learning in that way. Now, um, in the Arm School Programme approach, we sort of structure it slightly more than that. I think this is a uh, 
a feature of project-based learning as well is that we're adding more construct around the, the learning experience to try and shape it more vigorously, I suppose, and that makes it more effective, really. But then that also means that teachers have to be experienced with how to apply to, to make it more effectively. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, play-based learning is all about uh, learning through doing. It's about uh, getting that motivation to play, stimulating the learner and enhancing that experience that they develop new skills. And in, in so doing, especially with group work, they're developing uh, communication skills, language acquisition, acquisition, collaboration, and just generally concentrating more uh, on their learning. So there's, there's a lot to be said for play-based learning and how this eventually develops into project-based learning as they do progress through their time in school and through the various curricula that they're learning through this pedagogical approach. So why is play important? Now, this is a, uh, it's a really nice diagram that sort of sums up the six elements of play and how it can be used uh, to, um, to teach and um, or teach STEM subjects more dynamically. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, really important way to engage and motivate students. And you can see here, for example, um, it's, I think a good starting point for this is the active nature of it and also the engaging nature of it. Now, it's, it's easy to make projects and play based learning not engaging and not active. Uh, and and by, but so, so it's really important to consider how do you make your projects and your play um, relevant to what you're trying to teach them, but also uh, fun and engaging and, and also ultimately meaningful. How do we keep that sense of joy? Um, for the learners whilst having that structure around ensuring that they're learning what, them, what we want them to learn. And, you know, there is this, there's lots and lots of different ways to do this. And by instilling a little bit more structure around what we're trying to get them to do in terms of the uh, Armscore program approach, you know, with the success criteria and using some hardware, we can retain all of the uh, joyful and active and engaging elements whilst also having a, a, a solid foundation and a solid learning experience for for the learners uh, and so they can progress through and, and actually learn things by applying the very skills that we that we seek for them to learn and and ensuring that it's meaningful again this is all about context which we touched upon and covered in depth in the uh, in the last session but why contexts have to be there to make the learning meaningful um, and then also the delivery of it um, you know the learning has to be um, iterative and you know this is a good part of physical computing more generally is the projects um, because they have a uh, a physical nature to them and you're programming them and you, you have success criteria which builds in complexity they have to iterate through that solution uh, to improve it and to meet all of the success criteria so all of these elements together and through the group work and making it socially interactive it's a really really powerful approach um, and then there is there is some um, there is some research showing that to this that play based learning is, is up to 20 times more impactful than traditional didactic learning um, these, these are quite small studies as you, as you generally get in educational research, but I think that's a really interesting uh, statistic that uh, this, this style of learning is, is, is very, very, very impactful compared to uh, traditional approaches, which is, I think is a, is a testament to why we should be doing more of this despite the, the, some of the logistical complications that you can get with physical computing and projects and play-based learning more generally. So what is play-based learning and how does it interact with practical computing? Now we've seen this diagram before. This is how, this is the ARM score program schema. So this is all of the different elements that we need to consider when putting together project and play-based learning, practical computing learning experiences. So there is this element of uh, hardware, such as like the microbits, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, they need to, well, they don't need to, but they, it's, it's good to have a sort of a basic understanding of the different electronic uh, components. But for very, very young learners, which, will, which is what we'll be focusing on today, we'll be looking at just single pieces of kits. So, for example, micro bits uh, and how we don't really need to focus on some of the more complex uh, elements of the electronics and just use the device as it is uh, and try to eke out learning from that. Uh, another important element, though, is the is the input process output bit, so the IPO bit. That's a really important bit to understand. So they start to uh, we start to uh, develop learners in their understanding of uh, of systems and how uh, you know the input is, how these system, how these devices take input and do something with it and produce an output. And there's always this making element as well, which uh, that this is really really sparks the sort of the joy in learners that they have they have to make something. They're creating an artifact and they're applying computational practice to develop. A solution or a product, um, uh, which is all part of the uh, you know the narrative and the context that, which we give them, and this all sounds a little, little bit esoteric, but it will we'll show solid examples of this as we go through today's session.
and the next strand so the bits in green there uh, you know we we seek to give them problems which they serve which they can play to solve and so these are relatively open-ended although there is some concrete things that we want them to accomplish as they're doing it but they do it through play and these outcomes are linked to the curriculum so the problems whilst seemingly uh, can be abstract they uh, they do link to particular areas across different subjects and it is cross curricular as we'll see in the examples and we, we try to design them to be as, as engaging as possible and some of the examples we've got today are quite bite-sized so it's the sort of thing that may take 20 minutes uh, you know to an hour with younger learners but these can be built upon and mixed together uh, to create a much more uh, chunky experience and you could have this taking a full hour a full lesson or a full week if you wanted to depending on how far you wanted to apply this pedagogy in your everyday practice but ultimately it revolves around uh, letting the students play with the problem set with the hardware that we give them and solving real problems now with all com uh, practical computing projects there is an element of programming in this and so whilst this might seem uh, only applicable to computer science the you can use these physical devices uh, to teach cross curricularly uh, and apply programming to to do um, or to eke out learning from other subjects which again we'll see examples of as we go through um, and learning the sort of the basics uh, of the computational constructs and applying them confidently is really really important uh, especially with them um, in terms of practical computing um, and these can be used to solve problems and demonstrate theory and principles in other subjects uh, again which we'll look at and uh, the last bit is this concept of design and creativity because we're creating physical uh, assets or creating physical artifacts uh, it's, it's we should encourage learners to design what they're going to do so this sort of helps them think about what they're trying to achieve before they're actually doing it and they're going to do that creatively which again is has that um, that sort of joyful element to it because they can apply their creative skills and create something which is meaningful and it's theirs and they own it they made it but at the same time um, they uh, have thought about the problem set that they're trying to solve and, and ideally we want them to do this collaboratively we want them to do this in groups so that they can enhance all of the uh, full on six c's you know communication collaboration etc which we'll, we'll touch on shortly um, and so this is again enhances that learning experience by working in groups collaboratively to solve problems uh, in a meaningful way and all and this entire approach is uh, is exemplified in all of the arm school programs resources which you can get for free online and there'll be links to this later on so just to refresh ourselves on what the ASP schema is because it's really important to understand this structure and how this is applied through the projects that we're going to go through um, and this really is uh, what you can use as a template or scaffolding to allow you to create your own uh, play-based learning activities or project-based learning activities depending on the age group that you're working with and uh, so it's, it's whilst it's relatively straightforward in applying uh, the structure of this is really, really important so let's just let's go through it in order so first of all we give the learners a, a context or a scenario and this is the bit this is the sort of the hook uh, which is which gets learners in so this is what makes it relevant and engaging for them it's useful if it is familiar and relatable so it's something that students will already have some understanding of and with young learners it's really important to uh, have a set well you know your learners better than anybody so it's really important you can uh, give them a context or a narrative which is something that they can relate to and that could be something uh, in, your, in, in the local culture, in the local ecosystem, it's something in the school, it could be a theme uh, which the school is celebrating, it could be um, a local um, a local religious practice or, or anything really, you can base these projects on almost anything as long as the learners start out with some familiar, familiarity with it or it has that sort of human link and it's, it's something that the students will uh, sort of generally understand the conception of and once you have that uh, that context uh, and that narrative you can then bake in uh, some more of the formal structure around the success criteria so this is the the learning objectives this is what we want them to actually do and this is where um, we sort of take a slight step away from traditional play-based learning where it's you, you just give them something and let them play with it and it's that sort of classical constructivist or and constructionist approach where it's just sort of learning through osmosis and we try to bolt on some some structure to ensure that there is uh, something relevant um, and that the play is leading them towards understanding of a concept or principle of which we are designing the activity to get them towards so 
it's useful when crafting the success criteria to start really simple make it achievable make it so they can do it in a matter of minutes uh, and be be very very specific as well you, you make sure that when you're writing the success criteria is that they the students can understand what it what it means and you can craft these in very very cleverly so that it seems quite simple but when they dig into the solution to the success criteria there is some they have to apply for example computational um techniques um, in order to do so and we'll look at examples of this a little bit later on as well uh, and that way you can eke out some of the, the complexity in this and, and that's really where the learning happens so they understand pr in principle what they need to do but to do that they have to apply computational skill and i think that's the sweet spot in project and play-based learning more generally is um, sort of almost masking the complexity of the learning in the task that you're getting them to do and they're enjoying doing it whilst they're uh, on that journey um so the next bit is the pro tips. Now, this is a little bit more malleable. It's uh, you can apply these liberally or uh, or not at all, depending on your learners and whether they need support or not. And this is part of the practice of play and project based learning. It's intervening where necessary. It's only give the students support when they need it. If they're, and that's really when they are stuck or they become disengaged. And really, we don't, you don't want that to happen at all. So you have to be quite on the ball with uh, how you support your learners. And um, you can do that through uh, various different ways. It could just be asking them questions. It could just be uh, giving them support material. It might be partial solutions. There, there's lots of ways to do this. And when we look at examples later, I'll show you some examples of partial solutions. And you could even break those down further and only give them partial, partial solutions. Uh, so you can just prompt them and prod them into the right direction. Next bit is stretch tasks. So this is a uh, essentially additional success criteria, and this is uh, there to stretch your um, more able learners. You know, most classes are mixed ability, and some students are going to get through the success criteria quicker than others. And so it's really important to have some additional goals there that can um, make these tasks more complicated um, and also more open-ended to, to keep these learners on track and they can just improve their product to make sure that it meets the success criteria more thoroughly without going off piste and doing something completely differently. So uh, the, getting successful uh, or good stretch tasks is, is really, really important to keep the learners engaged uh, and on topic. And then at the very end of the lesson is this sort of final thought or this reflective exercise to consolidate the learning, to get them to think about why they are they have are doing or have done what they have done. You know, have has their artifact, has their solution met the success criteria, and why does that matter? And you know, that's uh, sort of like closing the closing the circle of this, uh, and you know, making the um, um, you know, making it all concrete and absolute once again, uh, so that they understand uh, what they've done first of all and and uh, the sort of profundity of that uh, and uh, also what techniques they've learned because they may have learned new computational techniques whilst going through some of these problems and, and not even be aware of it and that's the sort of the, the magic of this of this approach is that they are doing complex things um, almost uh, hidden amongst the activities so having an understanding of, of this schema is important because this this is reflected in all of the tasks that we uh, publish uh, as part of the arm score program um, and you can use this again as a framework to create your own teaching learning activities as, as part of project or play-based learning so there's a couple of other pedagogical tools which are useful for this now these um, are the same as in project-based learning and again these are there um, depending on what age range you apply this to because you can use play-based learning with very young students but also up to older students up to sort of uh, you know grades nine and beyond um, but a, a, an interesting model to use and to get students to think about is this IPO model so input process and output this is particularly useful for STEM subjects and even more particularly useful for computing based projects where you have these physical devices that you are seeking learners to develop artifacts from and so they have inputs they have things like um, microphones buttons and the like um, that those inputs can be then processed so you can take when a button is pressed that can trigger a particular process and consequently trigger an output so getting students to think systematically in this way is, is, uh, is really really important um, and applying this as a problem solving tool is, is really really important and we'll look at examples of this again uh, with the projects that we come on to shortly
another element of um, which really helps with STEM and uh, and just projects more generally is, um, is is design thinking. Now you might think this sort of uh, is separate to play, uh, and then you know it kind of formalizes a little bit too much. And, uh, and and I would agree this this maybe makes it a little bit too formal. But this is here as a tool, um, and if um, you want to give students something slightly more formal, then getting them to design their projects is is ultimately beneficial because it gets them to makes them think harder about what they're doing it helps them iterate on their designs it makes them focus on the objectives it makes them uh, consider their users needs uh, and they also get to design elements through drawing they get to consider the materials that they've got when they have to make an artifact and it helps them sort of uh, prioritize which features they're going to develop first and ultimately it helps them analyze what um, problems they're actually solving and how they do it and you can also tag on things like um, more multimedia elements like branding um, logos and that helps with the, with the whole teamwork it helps them sell their solution it also makes them uh, you know sort of iterate and improve upon uh, what they've developed so this is this is a tool to be applied um, depending on your intuition with your students you know would this help engage and motivate them is Hi, on. Hi, on. Yeah, uh, so that seems uh, to be a technical issue. Uh, please hold on for uh, three minutes. We will resume it soon. Is this a good starter activity, or um, or would this switch them off in the first place? So play-based learning, you know, this is this is something that could be applied with older students, not necessarily younger students, but it's just there in the quiver of uh, of PBL tools. Another really really important element that we talked about before was this element of uh, iterative development, and um, you know, this is fundamental to physical computing activities, but also in, in any subject where um, we, we first of all get learners to focus on the success criteria. We, we want them to plan and design it, but that isn't completely necessary for 
um, for, for play-based learning, we do want them to develop a solution and they can sort of usually skip over the, the plan bit of it and just jump straight into solutioning, um, generally because the problems we give them for play-based learning are simpler and are, are sort of small chunks. Um, and so they can just jump straight into iterative development and then they test their solutions and then, then conduct obviously remedial action where that is necessary. And so, and they'll probably go through this cycle many, many, many times. Usually with these smaller play-based activities, you'll only give them you know, one to three problems. And so they'll only have to go through this a few times. But generally, if they've not used the tools or they've not applied the computational techniques required with these projects, is that they'll go through this a few times. And it's, it's useful to get them to get used to this. And this is where we can introduce this concept of fail early and fail often and, and not allowing um, things not working or things going wrong to disengage students. Um, and this is something that students need to develop um, their sort of resiliency, really. And, and um, I've certainly experienced this in teaching where if it doesn't work how they intended straight away, students can switch off and they don't know what to do. They become disempowered. And really, we need to um, condition the students so that they can they're confident in being iterative in, in their development and applying problem solving skills to work out what went wrong. You know, is the input what we expected? Is it being processed in a logical way? Is the logic in their program doing what we think it does? Is it testing for what we think it does? And is the output <clears throat> sufficient um, for the input? And ultimately, does it solve the success criteria? And so this is where they need to evaluate their product, evaluate their solution uh, and see it, is it doing what we want them to do and i've certainly found this with students when you first introduce um, this methodology is that they um, can can get away from the success criteria and tend to get, go and do whatever they like and this is where again we we try to steer the play steer the um, the, the what they're doing so that it, it isn't just completely random and that they are working towards uh, coming up with a solution to the problem and that again that's where that sort of slightly more formal approach um, of the ASP approach uh, comes into play and, and not quite so kind of open-ended but that ultimately is, uh, is beneficial for the learner. So I've mentioned uh, Fullen's six C's before it's um, this is a really really important uh, thing to consider when when planning these types of activities is we want the students to conduct these projects and problems collaboratively we want them to work with each other uh, and this um, helps motivate and engage the learners and by doing these problems and these projects uh, and through play they are naturally um, working as a team they're naturally collaborating they are they are being uh, collaboratively creative as well they have to think about what they're doing how they're going to solve the problem and how do they ideate a solution based upon the resources that you give them and um, you know this is this is where some students may be stronger in, cer in certain areas than others but by collaborating with each other and communicating effectively they can all be brought along on that play-based journey um, and so it's, it's a really really uh, Really, really strong point of this. I mean, it's quite difficult to assess these soft skills, and you can generally only do it through uh, through sort of direct observation and having a, a schema that you can assess it through. And we'll touch on this in uh, in the next session, based upon assessment of project-based learning. But you, you will see this naturally coming out um, as students work their way through uh, the problem solving uh, through the play uh, uh, in their group. So it's um, yes, it's an interesting facet, which is um, uh, happens naturally as part of play, especially in group-based play. Uh, and uh, how that helps the group move towards the solution. So just to sort of sum summarize all this up, it's um, so the core elements to, to play-based learning, it's ultimately all about problem solving and we want them to, to be solving a problem and that problem can be contextualized, it could be uh, subject-based um, or it can be just um, something very, very simple. Um, but and, and how to get there, we want to encourage them to think in that input process output, the IPO model. We want them to work collaboratively, as, uh, as we just mentioned. We, we need them to work iteratively uh, and being resilient as part of that. And it helps if they design it as well. So uh, I would encourage everybody to consider uh, this this core sort of flower of, uh, of, of play-based learning and hold that in your mind as we're going through the different examples today uh, and how we can apply this in the real world and in the classroom. So just a brief talk about the hardware we're going to be looking at today. The example, the examples that we, uh, the example projects for play-based learning that we're going to go through have been designed to work with a microbit version two. There are obviously other development boards available as well, but these are all based upon this one because it has certain features which are really, really user-friendly um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a really good tool to 
use for play-based learning with younger learners because it's so accessible and easy to work with and it just works um, other other boards are available as well um, but this has some interesting features and just just to, just to draw your attention to the new features of the version 2 which is the latest one from the from the microbit foundation um, is that this the new uh, microbits have got a speaker on board which um, previously they didn't uh, it's also got a microphone so you can do more sound based play um, it's, it's, it's just generally faster it's got a more powerful processor um, it's got more memory available to it and it also has an additional button and you can see the all the new features of that on the uh, on the arm school program youtube channel so i won't dwell on this too much because this is for younger learners but um this these devices can be plugged in via usb uh, and can be programmed via an online environment called make code so there are there are two ways to program the microbit for younger learners and certainly with them um, the play-based learning approach we would expect you to use block-based learn uh, an interface such as make code there are others available there are many other um, ways of programming a microbit there is the online micro python tool if you're working with slightly older learners and who may have already studied some computer science but this does complicate it obviously and um, i would advocate to stick with the block-based uh, approach because you can do a lot more complex stuff with the blocks without getting lost in the syntax and the structure of the code and it just it's just much more accessible uh, and easy to work with and you can do a lot more stuff faster with the blocks um, but you know there are other tools available as well it just makes connecting the micro bit to the code much easier and quicker through this because you just plug in the usb cable hit download and it just um, as long as you pair the device to the computer it downloads the, the hex file straight to the micro bit uh, and then you're good to go um, and again uh, we need to just to cons consider that process make sure that learners uh, are familiar with how to get code from the environment to to the micro bit which takes just a few minutes it's a relatively simple process but just another part of this sort of physical computing approach so let's jump straight into the uh, the example projects for the younger learners so you'll you'll notice this um the structure is based upon the asp schema and also similar to the examples that we went through in the previous project these are just uh, sort of a simpler context with simpler success criteria and we're focusing on on the um the areas of the curriculum which are more applicable to younger learners so the very very first badge in this this uh, sorry very very first project uh, is a name badge and this is something that you could use as a project to um, get learners familiar with what a microbit is uh, or, or whatever device you're using and get them to do something nice and simple the so the name badge as you'd expect we would want to um, have the net their students name scrolling across the uh, the output or the LEDs on the on the badge that they're going to make so thankfully the microbit has uh, this LED matrix which um, which they can look at and uh, they can obviously put their name in there using some relatively simple blocks. So the problem or the context is um, you're a new student in a school and you need to make a digital name badge so students or other learners can know who you are. So that's you know, nice and simple, straightforward enough. And you might think, oh, that's, that's a little bit too simple. But when we dig into the success criteria, we can add in some additional complexity should we wish to. So for example, they have to create a digital badge using a microbit. So there's two elements there because they uh, you'll give, obviously give them a micro bit and the battery pack as you can see there in the hardware but they also have to uh, consider how they're going to stick the badge to them you know how do you actually make it into a badge and so there is a making element to this and this is where they you know crafting this into uh, into an artifact so they have to consider how they're going to do it they may wish to design it or you may encourage them to design it but that's just the first step is how do you deal with the physicality of a name badge before we start worrying about programming anything so there is that sort of making element and you can use things like a small bit of card with a safety pin you can maybe use velcro tape there's, there's a number of different ways of doing it depending on what resources you have available to you so that's just the first bit and that's just sort of the art and craft and uh, and this sort of making element of it so the next bit of it is to program the micro bit to display your name and this is relatively straightforward and we'll look at an, an example of, of that uh, shortly but um, that is just getting them to think about uh, how do you get the their name to appear on the LEDs uh, and it's very very simple and it's very, very accessible and most students will to work this out um, without your intervention whatsoever and um, it's, it's quite um, magical to see that happen is when students can use a, a program like make code or scratch or similar and just you know do stuff without even um, learning by doing effectively 
to add in some additional complexity for this we, we want them to add in an icon and this is where the creativity comes into it as well so that it shows their name and then the icon or a picture or, or whatever they decide to do so this is where the, you know, the play bit comes in as well and then for a, bit, a little bit more complexity we want them to add a theme song when, when a button is pressed so we're having some more of that input which is the button press and some output which is a theme song and they can use some of the pre-built um, patterns or music which are on the micro bit or they can design their own and then the last one again is trying to make this joyful uh, is decorating the badge uh, so they can express who they are so they've got their name they'll have an icon which represents them and they're going to decorate the physical badge itself um, in an arts and crafty way to represent who they are and this is where they can express themselves and you know and be, and be really creative and th this can be done um, uh, in a, a, as a group or it can be done individually this program works works nicely as long as you've got enough micro bits and resources to work with so this is a nice introductory type of project um, and with the sort of the showing them how to get the code onto the micro bit this might take half an hour to an hour depending on your class and what resources you have and obviously what computers you've got available and the like so this is a nice beginner friendly exercise and a, a really good place to start with younger learners so let's look at the, the IPO table now it's we don't want to dwell too long on this but it's just getting again getting the students to think about what the IPO process is and you might wish to demonstrate this at first and then get them to use this as part of their design but again you don't need to but it's just it's, it's a useful um, design structure to to uh, to look at as part of the, the learning and so the input initially would be um, you wouldn't have an input for uh, for the for the name showing on there you would just use some of the blocks sort of the show string block uh, and it would be in a loop so that it would be continually showing uh, and then the output would be their name appearing on the leds so kind of their name would scroll across the screen um, and then we'd also have an icon after that and, that, and also some some melodies but the melodies would involve an input because we want them to um, program it so that when they press a button the, the melody or play uh, or um, plays through the speaker so you've got the input button press process of uh, you know, triggering the, uh, the, the sound and then the output is the sound coming through the speakers so very very simple uh, and students will you know kind of get this just intuitively um, but it's um, just getting them to think about that IPO process which is quite helpful so here is some uh, example solutions for this so this is about as simple as you can get with these sorts of programs so you have a forever block and obviously whatever sits inside that forever block runs forever and then it shows a string so this is where we're introducing some of the sort of the computational constructs into this so it shows you what their name is and then it shows the icon and they can even use um, make their own icons as well there are blocks where they can just draw into those little darker blocks and, and make their own pictures so that will uh, naturally show their name and um, show the icons and you can either lead them through this if, if they require that as part of the, the teaching or you can let them explore and work it out for themselves it's um or and then you intervene again it really depends on how able the class is and uh, how young they are and how much time you've got to, to dedicate to this but you could do this as a lead exercise um, just for the first bit and then let them work out how to do the rest of it to, to get the sound to work with the v2 you do have to have that uh, on start block there where it sets the built-in speaker to on so you have to turn the speaker on and you'll see this in a couple of the other projects as well um, so that's uh, an important thing to not forget because uh, by default that isn't on because there are two versions of the micro bit and the v2 has the speaker whilst the v1 doesn't so you need, you need to enable that and then the, more importantly the bit underneath that um, is where you have the the IPO model so on button a pressed so the press when the button a is pressed it will then play that melody and they can choose uh, what melody that is there are lots of pre-built ones and they can choose how often it is played so that's the the computational bit there um, and uh, you can see the solution is relatively straightforward you can use this um, you could have this on the board you could have this printed out on little bits of paper if or um, or on card or whatever and so you can you can use this to to scaffold the learning and to show the learners how to do this um, and so some of them will just get it intuitively others may need a little bit more support and this is the sorts of solution that you can provide to them so I hope for that previous example made sense and uh, here's a slightly more complicated one so for example in this one we're going to be looking at animation uh, and concepts around sort of art and computing timing um, and you know what interaction is um, uh, for this for this context so the context is you're learning about animation and we're going to create an animation of an animal that can be controlled by the user so nice and simple so you could tag this onto learning if you're looking at um, uh, geography or uh, biology looking at habitats or anything like that so this, this is where this cr uh, cross-curricular element comes in or you may look at it from the uh, art and computing element and go nowhere to look at specifically what animation is and um, you know, how do we make animations and it, this is quite a nice simple one because we just need the the micro bit and the battery back for this we don't need 
any additional hardware um, so it's, it's quite simple resource wise so the success criteria then is we want them to design and make an animation of an animal and this is where the design bit could be quite helpful so you could give them some squared paper and they could design um, on that five by five matrix what that animal will look like uh, it could be you know it could be almost anything how do they how do they represent an animal uh, using a five by five matrix and so there's a sort of a, a design there and there's an, an abstraction layer where how do they turn you know a complex piece such as a lion or a giraffe or or, or a dog um you know into a five by five representation of that so that's an interesting one and then after that we can then work out how to uh, how to actually animate it so there might be sort of a default state of the animal moving or doing something um it's, it's useful to keep this to to two frames uh, which we'll, we'll see an example of when we look at the solution in a minute um, but they can animate it and make it as complex as they wish and some students will really get this quickly and do some quite complicated stuff um, but we'll, we'll, you'll see this as they as they progress through this uh, so to add in some more complexity to the challenge we want them to add a happy animation when a button is pressed so quite simple you know you press the button it makes the, the animal happy how do they represent happiness through the animation so you have to think about that um, and there are lots of ways to do that it might just be the animal jumps around it might be that it has a smiley face you know there's lots of ways to, to do this and that's kind of really open-ended and let the students kind of express themselves through that um, and then similarly um, using a slightly different feature or slightly different input we want them to create a, a, another a different animation when the animal is shaken so get them to think about um, what how an animal how, how an animal would be how would re, how do you react to being shaken would it be happy would it be sad uh, you know obviously the, the direction of travel here is that uh, the animal wouldn't like being shaken and so uh, as you've got the button press making it happy shaking it would make it sad or angry or whatever and so we need to think about uh, how would we represent that through animation and the last one there is how do you add in appropriate sounds so uh, again they can they can apply that however they see fit so it's a relatively simple set of um, problems there but they have to start simply and then add in some additional complexity uh, to make that work so as before let's jump into the ipo table and see how we can represent this uh, from a sort of programmatic or systematic um, angle and again you don't need to do this with the learners on paper or on the board but it's, it's a useful way to, to look at this so first of all uh, with animation you can have the sort of the default state of the pet so there isn't really an input but it just shows the the animation so let's say there'll be two frames um, and it will show the, the the icon it'll pause it'll show the second icon and that will loop forever and it will again show that on the screen so you can that is a sort of very very basic animation and we'll, we'll see a solution to this in just a second and then building on that you then want to make the animal happy so when there's a button press it may play a sound and then it shows a different animation and that's important that we we have these functions separate and this is sort of the event driven element for, from the from the computing world where um, it does something different when you press the button and in this case it's play the sound and play a different animation and then similarly again when uh, the input of shaking is sensed it then again plays a different animation and plays a different um, sound so all relatively straightforward just incremental steps incremental complexity and how we make this uh, artifact work and meet the requirements of this success criteria so now let's have a look at the the solution so we can dig into this and hopefully this will make it come alive a little bit more so here we can see the example solution so um, the default state is that bit in the middle so the the forever block so you can see there we've got um, it, let's let's call it a dog um, so the first frame there it shows you the the dog facing uh, to the left um, it then pauses for 200 milliseconds and then the head turns the other way so the dog as you can imagine that looping forever the dog's kind of like looking left looking right uh, and that's the sort of the, the default state for the, for the animal uh, so that so meets the first first success criteria and that's a very very simple implementation you could have the dog doing all sorts of different things it may have different um, it may uh, you know, it, could, it could do almost anything and this is where the students could be really creative this only uses two frames in the animation but you could have hundreds if you wanted to uh, next is the um, the how do you make it happy so when you're pressing a button so we've got the on button a press there on the on the left hand side and that first of all triggers uh, some some noise so it plays uh, the 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 nyan thing once and then you can see from the animation whilst that looks similar to the initial 
or, or the first frame is exactly the same really as the as the default state uh the the pause between it is is half as long so it's only 100 milliseconds so a tenth of a second and then the second frame is the is the image moved up so it's like it's jumping and you can see there that the tail there is lifted as well so that's sort of jumping up and down quite rapidly so it's you know it's, it's happy and you can you can imagine how a small dog jumping up and down it represents the happiness of the animal so it's this is where this sort of the abstract nature of representing animals through pixels uh, comes into play so there's lots of different ways to apply that and students will be very very creative when they do uh, the next stage is then um, is the shaking element of it and again you could represent that uh, using the using the similar iconography that you've designed there or you could have something more direct and you can see here we've got some, some pre-made icons that we use so it plays a different sound and it's uh, the melody there is called baddie which is like a sort of a you know minor key um, it's like a sad sound and then it shows the sort of the sad face pauses for a second then shows another sad face so you know the animal's clearly not happy uh, there so again lots and lots of different ways to to represent these emotions or states uh, using the inputs and processes and outputs and uh, as before we, we have to have that uh, setting the speaker to on at the top as well to make sure that the speaker works on the v2 micro bit so hopefully that makes sense and whilst these blocks are relatively simple you can see there's a lot going on under the hood and students um can can take this sort of the, these, these beginnings and, and and go mad with them really they can uh, add as much complexity as they want to they could stack in those pauses and this those show led blocks to create really complicated animations and um, obviously you're limited by the five by five matrix in what you can do but there is still an awful lot that you can do with that and you can create some really sophisticated stuff if they have time to play with it so hopefully that's um you know builds upon uh, the previous project and you've got a good example of how you can eke out some of this creativity from from this play-based approach uh, by having a good mix of open success criteria but whilst structured so that they have to apply some of these computational techniques that we've been talking about previously so next uh, example project so this is a slightly different one this has got more of a practical application in the classroom but hopefully this will be something that uh, is easily uh, applicable so we're going to create a classroom noise meter so this is a tool that's going to be used by the teacher uh, so the, the context here is your teacher is actually to create a digital noise meter to let them know when the class is being too loud so th this is quite generic but you could add in a something like you know the teacher is hard of hearing and so they don't know when the students are getting too loud or maybe this could be used when the teacher's out the room or something like that so th there's lots of you can play around with that context um, but really we need to think about how do we use the, the inputs processes and outputs to detect the threshold of, of loudness and uh, and what do we do with that and again this project is uh, resource wise is very very simple we can do this with just a micro bit we don't even really need the battery pack for this one um, but um, but you but you can do and the success criteria then uh, relatively straightforward but it uses a couple of different um, or it requires a couple of different features of the micro bit programming interface but they need to design and create a device that measures the noise level and shows it on a chart so this is where the complexity comes in because they may not have done charts before and so you may need to do some prep for this and explain to them what a chart is you know x and y coordinates and uh, bar charts and whatnot this may form part of a maths lesson or a computer science or an it lesson so you know they have to understand what a chart is first of all in order to be able to understand this or you could just let them um, loose with it and see what they come up with but or you could even give them part of the partial solution uh, so, that, so, that it, so that it meets the uh, initial success criteria and then let them um, play around with the second bit so it could be a nice short uh, project uh, so that, that's the first piece getting them to chart the noise level in the classroom and we'll look at how to do that in just a minute um, they also have to have the device to play an alarm sound when things get too loud so this is um, the open-ended nature of it so the students have to determine what is too loud and you, I could imagine if this was in, in the classroom you'd have lots of fun in um, you could show the noise level detected by the micro bit uh, as it represented as a number um, and then you can get the class to make lots of noise and then you could then collectively decide what number is too loud uh, and then that could be the threshold that you set uh, in the groups and then you can use that to determine when the alarm is triggered um, so, and then you'd have fun testing that as well obviously because the students like making noise and you know it's a, a, bit, a bit a fun play element to, to to add into this so whilst the the, the the project might seem a little bit dull on the on the surface how you apply this now you deliver it can be quite engaging and quite fun and in terms of the subject focus um you know, there is an element of physics so they have to understand how what noise is and uh, how the the micro bit can sense this noise maybe you can maybe even talk about decibels and you know what's the sort of the formal measure of, of sound 
Um, you could even go into the, um, the electronics of how the how a microphone picks up the sound and it determines uh, the, the the power or the, you know, the decibel level, but that may be a little bit too far for younger learners. And then there's the uh, the computing element of it as well about um, how do you set the threshold uh, of noise and, um, and then how the, you, know, you apply event driven programming to to set the alarm off when it reaches that level, which involves a little bit of selection and a little bit of logic, which we'll look at in just a minute. So that's a, you know, a different take on all of this. And it's something with a bit more of a practical approach and adding a little bit of structure and try to eke out some of the, the complexity of the features of the, uh, of the, the micro bit. So let's have a look at the IPO. So the IPO for this one is pretty straightforward. Um, there is a microphone um, and uh, it's, it is obviously listening constantly when, when you tell it to do so. And it's comparing the input to a given threshold. Uh, and then when that threshold is met, it will um, it will play the alarm tone and it will, whilst it's measuring that, it will display the uh, the noise level on a chart on the micro bit. And it's a relatively uh, straightforward chart. Obviously it uses that five by five uh, matrix, so it's not a particularly sophisticated chart, but you can see the peaks and troughs of when there is noise and when there isn't noise. And there's obviously an ambient level of noise. Um, so you'll have to see that uh, all the time. And you can use this, um, you, you can see this quite uh, nicely on the micro bit when you plug it in and add the, add the code blocks to it. So let's have a look at the solution because this is slightly more involved than the, the previous project. So, so this is about as complicated as, as we get with these uh, with these projects. But so it's relatively straightforward, but it does involve some slightly more complex blocks. So uh, let's, let's start on the right. We're obviously uh, setting the speaker to one as we have done in the previous projects and you know, uh, on the right is where we need to look at this in a little bit more detail. So inside that blue forever block, we the first first sub block is this plot bar graph of sound level. So sound level you can see there is uh, sort of purpley pink, um, and that is a, a built-in block um, which which takes the input from the microphone and it plots it. Uh, and you can see that up to 255. So the the maximum um, well, there are 255 points of measurement. Uh, and you can you can set it to you know uh, be within a particular band of that. But if you put 255, it measures the full range of sounds uh, available uh, on the micro bit. So, and if you just have that on its own inside a forever block, it will it will draw this nice bar graph of sound. And you can test that by clapping near the micro bit or uh, or shouting at it or getting the class to, you know rousing them to make some noise. So you can see uh, these these bar graphs going up and down. And you can you can have an, another level of detail if you go into the make code simulator um, and you can click on the, the data tab and you can see a more in-depth view of that, of that uh, graph going up and down um, so it gives you a little bit more data but on the micro bit obviously it's uh, limited by that five by five matrix then underneath that we have some uh, some selection so we are using an if statement and um, inside that we have some logic so this is worth unpicking and spending a little bit i'm looking at because students may not initially know where this stuff is and what this stuff means so if you know i mean you can explain them you know, it, it's testing for a certain condition so if the sound level is greater than or equal to 200 so obviously the maximum is 255 so 200 is kind of uh you know uh, three quarters of the way up or whatever um and it's, it's testing when it goes above that threshold then it triggers the bit underneath it so um it's really important that they at least are a little bit familiar with less than greater than and less than and greater than or equal to um, so there's the symbols there in the middle and so if the sound level is equal to or greater than 200 then and only then will it run the next block and the next block is a loop and this is again another really, really important um, computational construct you know the selection with the if statement is one uh, and uh, iteration and looping is another and you can see that in the green block there so it repeats uh, what's inside that block two times so when the threshold is met it will loop through that two times and that is plays the middle C so it plays that beep it plays it once and then it um, it pauses for, for 100 milliseconds and then it repeats it two times so that's your alarm it's the beep beep uh, and you can set that to be as many times as you, as you want to but that is essentially how you recreate that alarm sound uh, when that threshold is met so that's the sort of the logic of that and it looks relatively straightforward but it's worth um, letting the students explore to see if they work that out or maybe you would give them a partial solution uh, using something like the microbit classroom where you might give them that um, forever plot and if selection but let them work out where to put the uh, greater than what the threshold is and what the, where the sound level 
a bit is because they could work that out from from the bit above it where the sound level variable is in there so it's it's uh, you could you can give them or take away different elements of this to to structure this depending on how long you want to spend on the computational element um or you could just take one bit out and let them work it out so there's, there's lots you can do with this um to to focus on the computational thinking elements or not but this is probably the most complex one i do with them um, with with younger learners so hopefully that makes sense and hopefully you can see how you could um, do some interesting stuff with these types of projects so there's some examples of, of the projects that you can do um, using a micro bit. Now, when you're coming up with your own projects, it's worth thinking about how to contextualize these in a way which is relevant and engaging, as I've mentioned before, and why contexts are important in the previous session. But a really good source of projects is the Global Goals. Uh, the Microbit Foundation have their own set of projects based upon the Global Goals, so it's worth checking out their resources as well. But if you just go on the Global Goals website, um, there are um, lots and lots of different contexts there, and you can see some of them there, and you can craft problems and play-based activities based upon those uh, and there's, there's a, it's a gold mine of, of things to play with so that's, that's a really good source for them to look at and it makes it you know relevant and engaging uh, there's also the do your bit competition from microbit that they run every year where students have to come up with a solution to one of the global goals using a microbit so that's a really really fun competition and i encourage you to encourage your learners to take part in that competition because that's really really exciting and, yet, and they're really applying technology to make a difference to the real world and that makes it thoroughly engaging and also where uh, they should enjoy doing it and learn a lot whilst doing it and you can this begs the question and i've, I've had um i've had this slide in previous uh, presentations but you now why aren't we using this sort of stuff more i mean my, the microbit foundation conducted some research if, a couple of years ago about and you can see from the st statistics here that um using physical computing as part of play-based learning and project-based learning uh, is, is very very effective um, and you know, so it does beg the question, why aren't we doing more of this? And it, it largely boils down to resources uh, and um, how this type of pedagogy is, is different and more complex than traditional didactic teaching and learning and teachers are time pressured, which I completely understand. You know, I, w I was a teacher for many, many years and I understand the pressures at play. Um, but the, the efficacy and the impact that this, this pedagogical approach uh, allows is profound and should not be ignored. So uh, please do consider this when um, when thinking about whether to apply this or not in your subject. It's not just in computing. Uh, this this pedagogical approach can be applied to any subject, um, and you can see the impact impacts uh, if you craft uh, suitable uh, and relevant and engaging learning experiences based upon this approach. As a next step, it's worth checking out the ARM score program resources. Um, so you can there's some links here that you can uh, click when these are shared after the fact. Um, and you can there are, there are whole courses and lots and lots of projects to play with. Uh, there's also lots and lots of resources on the Microbit website as well. For example, the Do Your Bit competition. Um, and the, the stuff on the Microbit site is really good for younger learners. So um, similarly to the projects we've explored today, uh, there's ones on there that are even simpler and they also have some more complex ones as well. So there's a, there's a nice spread from the Microbit re resources through to the ARM score program ones, which are slightly more complex uh, and sophisticated. So we're, there's a whole range of there that you can apply to your learners depending on their age and ability and whichever subject you may be teaching. As I mentioned before, whilst these examples are based on the microbit, there are other boards available. There's a whole swathe of technology out there. Uh, but here's a, here are the, the most common ones. You obviously have the Raspberry Pi, which is a full-blown computer, and you can do some really complicated stuff with it. Uh, similarly, you've got the um, Raspberry Pi Pico, which is a slightly more simple device, but um, can be used for all sorts of interesting IoT projects and for programming. You've also got the Arduinos and various flavors of that. Um, and it really is you know, for you to decide, have you got these already available? Um, uh, if, if you're buying them in, you know, what the cost of these are, because they all vary in price. You know, what features do they have um, and what's right for your learners? Um, and so you, know, you need to make that decision yourselves based upon you know, the, your resources available. Um, and if you wish to, if you're not familiar with any of these, then uh, I would advocate to have to start with the microbit because it's very, very accessible. It does an awful lot and you can do some really interesting projects with it. But you can do all of these projects with all of these boards with the right hardware and uh, software interfaces. But that's uh, obviously more for your design and technology and computing teachers to experiment with um, if they've got the time to do so. So the next step is uh, over to you. You've, uh, we've given some examples of these projects which you can, are free to use in your classroom and to have a play with. Um, and there is all the ARM score program resources which you can take and use and uh, you know, go and design your own as well. Uh, take maybe start with some of the ideas we've looked at today, uh, deliver them in your classroom and iterate on them, improve on them, apply these 
um, play and project-based learning principles yourself. Uh, what I found with these projects is I would initially write them, I would then test it with a class, I would then tweak and change them, and usually by the third time you've delivered it, it's 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 uh, you know it's perfect, and then you can um, use it as much as you like. But uh, yeah, do share these online. We really like to encourage uh, collaboration between teaching colleagues as well. Uh, stick them online if um, if there is a place for you to do so. There's lots of um, communities of practice where you can share these sorts of things. Uh, so do um, you know sharing is caring, and it's it's a really good idea to put these out there so other people can uh, improve their practice based upon your experience and, and, your, and your learning and, and, and delivery. So yeah, please do that and uh, have a go at creating your own and sharing them online as well. We love to see this as being a sort of a, a, a the starting point of, of your exploration in physical computing and, uh, and plot projects and play-based learning. So yes, uh, do let us know uh, if you come across something useful. And if you do want to learn more about uh, physical computing and all of the um, elements of it, we've touched upon obviously the simpler end of the spectrum today. But if you're interested in the pedagogical approaches, how to assess it and some more of the detail around the theory that underpins all of this, um, there are the um, there is a course on edX which you can access for free. I just need to go to edX.org and uh, search for project based learning. And there are four courses there that you can use. And these are teacher training courses which are freely available. Um, there is a, a charge for the certification for these courses, but the access and the content is absolutely free. So feel free to engage with those resources. Um, and thank you very much for um, listening to this session today. And um, I encourage you, if you're if you're interested in this sort of stuff and you've missed the other uh, CBC videos, to check out their YouTube channel and to see the other sessions. Um, and also check out the ones which are coming up in the coming months. So thank you very much for, for listening to this. And we'll move on to the next part of the session. Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, before we um, before we we go on to uh, Q and A, um, I'll just hand over in a moment to um, Surya, my colleague, who'll talk about the feedback form for this session. Um, I hope everyone found that useful. Um, I understand from the Q and A that some people have had bandwidth issues with clarity of the slides and audio, um, but I hope that 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 came through um, in the end for you. We've had um, a few questions through, which we'll cover in the Q&A, um, but um, first I'll just hand over to my colleague, Surya, who'd like to talk about gathering your feedback on this session. Surya. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good evening, everyone. I have shared the uh, feedback form link in the chat box. Okay, thanks, um, thanks, Surya. So, if you um, if you would like to um, complete that feedback form, that would be fantastic. You can see that in the chat box. It will take about um, maybe thirty seconds to complete, and we um, we always welcome your feedback and make sure that we we look at it in detail after each session. Right, a few questions that came up. Um, so um, a question came up about the previous session. So I will, um, I'll just go back to that um, uh, briefly in a moment. Um, also about PowerPoints for this session. So after the, um, after the, this session is complete, within a few days, we'll be sending you a uh, link to your certificate. So that's, that's how you'll get it, is via email, by the email with which you registered for this session. Um, and you will also be sent the uh, presentation. So that includes the recording of this session. So if you're looking back as you were going through, you were looking back at uh, previous uh, slides and wanting to access them, you'll be able to do that shortly once you receive the, um, that email. Um, also, there, were, there was a question about practical examples of this um, in action. So I'd really encourage you to, um, if you're interested in this approach to teaching and learning, whether it's play-based by, play or project-based learning, to go to school.arm.com, uh, where you can access all of our resources um, free of charge. And there's um, lots of examples of uh, projects that you can run with your students. That includes um, uh, project books that you can download for free. Um, there's one here. Uh, which is very popular called microcourse and this is um, 
this uh, really builds on on the ideas that Rob presented in the main session, taking you from an introduction to physical computing all the way to uh, block-based coding and uh, your first steps in uh, coding with MicroPython. Um, so let's just go back to the um, perhaps to the previous slide um, where we talked about the training that we've done so far and the ones that are coming up. So you can access um, links to the uh, recordings of all the previous sessions on the on ARM community. So this is the site that you went to uh, to register for this session. Um, if you if you scroll down, you'll see there are uh, links to play the previous sessions. Um, and this re those sessions really um, introduce uh, the idea of physical computing, what it is, um, and the practice of project-based learning in the classroom. Uh, the first session is very much um, starting from uh, assuming no prior knowledge at all. Uh, that's get started with physical computing. The second session looks at more deeply at the um, the uh, pedagogical aspects of project-based learning. It looks at the the theory that underpins it and how that translates into um, the sort of practice that we and and our partners um, advocate for um, uh, in in terms of evidence-based practice within the classroom. And then the the, the third session, um, which is the one that we ran in November, contexts are key. Um, really is focused on uh, enabling you as educators to develop your your own projects um, based on contexts that you feel are of most interest to your students. So looking at your cohort, what are the sort of contexts that would really engage them and really um, uh, 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 motivate them to to progress through um, a project either as a team or independently with you as a facilitator. Um, so yes, please do um, please do explore those and uh, watch them if you haven't joined the previous sessions. Um, I should mention as well that there, there as we understand it, there there'll be no um, circular for the future future sessions. So please do put these in your calendar if they're not already there. So twenty second of February. Um, uh, same time, everyone is, is it starts at the same time, 3 p.m., 22nd of February, 15th of March, and 26th of April. Um, there are descriptions of those future sessions on the uh, community site. Um, so, uh, Surya, we've got a comment here saying the, the link to the form isn't working. Um, so, I'm assuming that this is, um, this may be a, an issue that is not uh, that is not affecting everyone, but if you could possibly look into that, that would be great. Yeah, uh, yeah, we are receiving responses, uh, so okay. fine. Okay, good. Uh, great. Uh, okay, so um, just a few other questions that came up from a uh, teaching and learning perspective. There was a question there about Prim. So um, evidently, someone was very, uh, very, very much paying attention at the beginning of the session there, where Rob briefly mentioned the PRIM methodology. And this was um, this is an approach to planning uh, programming lessons and activities in the classroom. Uh, PRIM is P-R-I-M-M. Um, and it is, uh, those, though, that's an acronym, which stands for uh, PREDICT. So you give, give students a, a, a piece of code. Um, you encourage them to predict what it will do. They take a look at it. What, what do they think it will do? They then run it uh, to see what it does in practice. Um, were they right? Are there any surprises there and why? Investigate it. So they really look at the structure of the of the code to see if they can understand why it's been uh, structured the way it is. Uh, they then start to modify it. So changing perhaps variables within the, within the code to see the effect that that has on the output. And then finally, uh, make um, where students are introduced to a new problem where the solution is going to require a variation of that of that code uh, that they've been introduced to. So that's getting them to understand its application and how they can uh, adapt it for new problems. Uh, and that, that methodology was developed um, by 
Sue Sentence, actually also based here in, in Cambridge. She now runs the Computer Science Education Research Centre, which is a uh, joint initiative between the Raspberry Pi Foundation and uh, uh, Cambridge University here. Okay, so um, another question that came up was around the difference between play-based and project-based learning. So I think for those of you who've joined previous sessions, I think you'll see a lot of the commonalities there between play-based play learning and the uh, project-based learning, which we discussed in particular in the first two sessions, looking at the structure and the kind of um, uh, the, 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 the way that you can uh, structure the learning and facilitate that as an educator. And I think essentially what, what, what the presentation was trying to put forward is that there are, um, you're, you're basically using the same uh, set of tools between play-based learning and project-based learning. The difference is typically the age of the learners and also the level of uh, formalization that's involved in applying those tools and techniques with your class. Um, so just as an example, um, partway through the presentation, Rob showed the design thinking sheet, uh, which encourages students to, to plan and uh, sketch their, their designs um, for a solution. So in that instance, you, you adapting it for younger learners, uh, you might really focus that, that planning session on sketches of their ideas, as opposed to the more, the more formal uh, parts of that. So a lot of commonalities there, which is why it forms part of the uh, the, the, this, this uh, series of webinars that focuses on project-based learning. And um, another question about the application of this to other subject areas. So um, Rob did mention that the approach, uh, play-based learning approach, project-based learning approach uh, can work with, um, with other subject areas. And I think that's, hopefully that will have come across in the presentation. You can see a lot of opportunities there for extending it into other subject areas and also um, working across the curriculum, whether it's at, at primary school or into um, secondary school. As an example, the uh, animated animals project, uh, that could form part of a wider investigation into the natural world, which could bring in uh, science, it could bring in literacy. Um, you could uh, perhaps um, extend that to look at how uh, technology is being used to uh, protect the environment by uh, monitoring, using sensors to, to, to monitor uh, things like migration patterns. Uh, for more advanced students, you might look at how the kind of sensors that would appear in um, the physical computing devices that we're talking about, microbits, uh, Arduinos, etc., how they are being used to um, help stop deforestation. So um, there is uh, um, uh, sensors uh, are being used to uh, capture the sounds of sounds of forests and um, AI is then used to identify within those sounds uh, the sound of chainsaws, which enables a conservationist to understand where logging is happening and uh, target that and hope, hopefully reduce it. So there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunities for um, extending this kind of approach into other uh, subject areas. And then a final, a final question that's come up, I think, is um, a very practical one about where um, where I can buy physical computing uh, kit and how much does it cost. Well, I think it's important to say that again, as I covered at the beginning of this uh, session, that ARM ARM uh, is uh, doesn't uh, manufacture or um, or uh, distribute uh, the, the sort of physical computing devices that we've been talking about in this series. Um, it's really that our our technology underlies the uh, the microprocessors that appear within them. Um, but you can find, I think, if you if you um, if you put it in a search engine, if you search for the device, you can find links uh, to local distributors. As an example. I think the Microbit V2 Go Kit, which gives you everything you need to, to get started, it includes batteries, um, is in the region of 1400 rupees, just to give you an idea of the, um, the cost of that. Okay, so um, let me move on to 
the final bit, which is really to say thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate your taking the time out um, to join these sessions with us. I would like to, to thank once again um, CBSE, uh, Dr. Saha and Mr. R.P. Singh for the opportunity to, to collaborate on these uh, this series of, of webinars. Um, in terms of next steps, we've um, talked about the, uh, the, the edX uh, program that we have available. If you're interested in any of the themes that we've discussed today or any of the other webinars, uh, please do uh, search for Teaching with Physical Computing on edX.org, uh, sign up for free, and you can take a deep dive into these topic areas. Um, the feedback form is in the chat. We, again, we'd very much welcome those uh, your feedback if you can, can provide that to us. And we hope to see you at the next session in February. Okay, we will um, we'll close it there. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time.